uh, citizens of Israel the strength and resilience that you show enables all of us to conduct this operation in a very calm and calculated way. I thank you for your resilience and for your unity, especially in the difficult times. Uh, the strong cooperation between me, the Minister of Defense, and the uh, Chief of Staff, our cooperation is strong and it enables us to plan in a thorough way all the operations and to implement them. In the beginning of the operation, we promised the citizens of Israel to bring back calm and order and we will continue to operate until this goal will be reached no matter how much time it will take and how much force it will take. Uh, the strong support uh, by the United States and Europe of our uh, need to uh, defuse terrorists and disarm the terrorists is very important for the state of Israel. In relation to Gaza, uh, I share the very deep anguish felt by the Irish people at what we've been witting, uh, and indeed the frustration uh, that I... Uh, that I feel from this afternoon's engagement, uh, that really, to be blunt, that we and other international voices uh, have so, so far been unable to exercise the type of influence that perhaps we might like, or the type of influence depicted from some sources, uh, to, uh, to impress upon uh, either side, both sides, uh, to choose a different path. Earlier in the debate, I set out the government's position in the conflict. Uh, which I can summarize as this, that Israel uh, is entitled to defend itself, the people and its territory, uh, but is not entitled to do what it's doing. Uh, if, with, your, with your permission, uh, I'll confine myself to a, a number of questions that were raised in the course of the debate. I apologize in advance if I don't deal in sufficient detail with every question that was put to me, because uh, I, I, I understand that, that a certain time frame was put on the debate, but I do welcome the opportunity, Kirla. Can I beg the indulgence and colleagues to uh, uh, allow me to deal with, with uh, most of the many issues that were put to me by way of question in the course of the debate? Uh, I think it's fair to say that the most questions that we had this afternoon centre around Ireland's abstention uh, at the uh, UN Human Rights Council. I, I refer specifically to the uh, remarks earlier of Senator Norris, Senator Mark Conway, uh, at, at Senator Pascal Mooney. And could I say that I believe that there has been some, some misapprehension uh, of Ireland's vote on the resolution. Now, Ireland, has to be said, didn't oppose the resolution. We made, a very, we made a very clear statement at the Council session, condemning, condemning civilian deaths, stating that we believed international law had been breached, and supporting supporting an investigation into all such breaches, including those by Israel, including those by Hamas, and including those terrorist activities by other splinter groups that were referred to by only one senator this afternoon, Senator Hildegard Nocton, because it's important that any such investigation would deal with all terror groups, along with our EU partners. We, we in, 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 as the Irish representative. We had a number of specific difficulty, precise wording of the resolution that we were being asked to agree with. This is not something we can ignore. This is not something that we can wipe away with the stroke of a pen. These related both to the need to ensure that all breaches of international law on either side would be investigated, our view that the wrong mechanism was being proposed to investigate in any event. For reasons of efficiency, we would have preferred to use the existing structures, such as the Office of the Much Respected High Commissioner for Human Rights herself. And we put forward this. We put forward this in the course of a robust debate. And indeed, we had expressed these concerns before to the Palestinian authors of the resolution. And they were fully aware of them when they drafted their text and when they wouldn't engage in the type of, of deliberation that is not only commonplace, but is essential in order to reach uh, a consensus. Ireland, throughout the day, and the EU group worked hard in negotiations to try and improve these specific points. We hoped that up until a very late point in the afternoon, that these negotiations would result in a text that we could vote in favour of. But unfortunately, this didn't happen. And at a very late stage in the afternoon, the Palestinian delegation received new instructions, which terminated 
terminated with pretty sudden effect the ongoing negotiations and this left Ireland with very little choice. The problems with the text were not resolved so the EU group took a common decision to abstain. And it's important and I listen carefully to what senators have said, it's important to be aware that abstention on a resolution in an international forum is not the same as a no vote, nor is it simply, nor is it, nor is it simply sitting on the fence. Country, the record shows this country so abstainer in the most cases signalling that they are not trying to block the resolution but they have specific and important difficulties which prevents them from supporting it. This was stated directly at the session which was fully understood by all other countries present. So I don't, I don't accept, I don't accept that this is in any way an abdication of responsibility. What were our resolutions? You, you, I, I, I gave them I gave them out in detail. I gave them out in detail. If you, if, if, if you listen to my remarks, you would have seen them. Uh, EU, EU members of the Council tried to vote together where possible. And this, again, if you check the record going back over the last series of meetings, you will see that we tried to vote together where possible in order to maximise our influence. And maximising our influence and having 28 voices instead of one is far from an abdication of responsibility is far from an abdication of our independence. It is engaging in a process to find a resolution to give us a strong voice. And I think every senator, every member of this, channel, this, this house this afternoon who was here, those who spoke, and indeed those who didn't, will agree that what's needed more than anything is, is a strong voice. And in this case, the EU had, had not decided on a common abstention. The indications were, late in the afternoon, that no other EU partner was considering a yes vote, while perhaps four of the nine EU member states might have voted no instead. And this was a point made by Senator Mooney from the other side of the House. And he's quite correct, and his analysis is quite proper, because this would have resulted in a worse voting outcome for the resolution, which would have had the, effect, would have, would have had the consequential effect of undermining the overall EU influence within the Council. So, the resolution having been passed by those present, as we knew it would be, Ireland will now fully support the Commission of Inquiry in fulfilling its mandate. And to, to, to uh, Senator uh, O'Brien, I think it may have been, or one of his colleagues who asked, were we now going to go back with a new resolution to change the wording? The answer to that is no. That issue has been dealt with. And, you know, let's see, let's see how uh, the process proceeds from here. I want to deal briefly Kahirlik, with the proposed expulsion of the Israeli ambassador as, 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 as evidenced by the contribution or the proposal of Senator Heffernan in recent times earlier by Senator Norris and others. And I note the contribution of independent Senator Sean Barrett in that, in that regard. And as we all know here, there are very frequent calls to expel the Israeli ambassador. Although you know, we never have a proposal about any other representative uh, in town or within, within the diplomatic corps. Our foreign policy has always been based, above all, on the resolution of any conflict by dialogue. We don't therefore respond to crisis by expelling the interlocutor, except in most exceptional circumstances. Ambassadors, uh, ambassadors exist, as we know, to allow, to allow clear channels of communication between governments and are more, necessary, are more necessary in bad times than in good. We have continually conveyed our views to the is Israeli government, to the ambassador here, our, uh, as was mentioned earlier in reference to my earlier contribution, Ambassador McKee in Tel Aviv. And really, Senators, I don't intend to deprive us of this vital channel, particularly, particularly in a time of crisis. Because the corollary, of course, would be the recall or the expulsion of our ambassador in Israel and the crippling of our own embassy in Tel Aviv. So as well as communicating our views to the Israeli government and reporting to me on the Israeli views of and the politics around the crisis, Ambassador McKee has a fundamentally important role to play at this time. And he has been personally engaged in the evacuation of Irish citizens and their families from Gaza, which I'm sure everyone will agree is a fundamental aspect of his role in times of crisis. And I refer back to the points made very well by my colleague, 
uh, Senator Mooney. And if we, expelled every, if we expelled every ambassador from Dublin for alleged human rights abuses, there would be very few CD-plated registration cars around our city. Here in Gaza City, the main hospitals and hospitals all over this strip really, really struggling. I, I warn you, the pictures are graphic. Overnight, Israel pounded the town of Rafa relentlessly. The only acute hospital was evacuated after a shell hit the entrance. According to the health ministry, more than 60 people have died in the past 24 hours. At the Shifa hospital in Gaza City, doctors are struggling not just with emergencies, but with a backlog of essential operations in buildings surrounded by refugees. This man, a student, has a leg wound. The bone is exposed. He's been waiting eight days. Me and my cousin were on the street, near a house that was blown up and shrapnel hit my leg. The doctor treating him is a British Palestinian volunteer. An eminent plastic surgeon, the Israelis made him wait two weeks before they let him in. No, no, he's a lucky boy. He doesn't have any fractures, he doesn't have any nerves that were hit. It's tricky though. The ultrasound he needs to find the arteries is dodgy, the scalpels blunt through overuse. And the patients that are well enough to be cared for on an outpatient basis, you can't send them home because they have no home to go to. You really don't want to be sending someone with an open wound to back to live in, a, in these makeshift uh, uh, tents that you see. So slowly the, the, the system is coming to a gridlock. We asked him how much longer till it breaks. Not much. I think a few days and that's it. There are only 31 intensive care beds in Gaza. 14 of them here at this often chaotic place. Casualties arrive constantly. A father with his son hit by a tank shell in their home. It's quickly clear that they are beyond needing intensive care. On a break from operating and out of his scrubs, Dr. Abu Sitta describes a mounting crisis. We've tried to evacuate some of the patients to other hospitals. But also, they've gone uh, blocked up. We opened a, a, an incomplete building in Shifa, but that had to be evacuated yesterday because the Israelis threatened to bomb it. Why did they threaten to bomb it? We have no idea. It's an empty, incompletely built wing of the Shifa hospital. And we had to move out all the patients out last night. To Palestinians, the extended family is a lifeline. But even some extended families have been wiped out completely. Three-year-old Ahmed was hit by fragments of a shell that struck the UNRWA school at Beit Hanun. His uncle shows me the pictures of the shrapnel and the wound. His mum sleeps here, they've nowhere else to go, and there are thousands like them. It's dangerous, there's nothing left, we've no home. My children are homeless, they are staying in different places. We need medical teams to be brought in, we need patients to be taken out, and we need this carnage to end. What's stopping that is the siege imposed by Israel to the north, and Egypt to the south. After weeks of war, the pictures can look like the same thing over and over again. Bombs, dead people, the injured. But for the health service, the effect is cumulative and it's about to crack. There is already an outbreak of scabies in the camps. When the water supply begins to look like this, other, more lethal epidemics may be close at hand.